Now, this Sunday, I want to introduce our special guest speaker, and uh, it's, it's, it's good because it gives me a, a Sunday off, and I appreciate that so much. But Reverend Mike Newson, or Pastor Mike from Lawson Heights, is our spe- a guest speaker this morning, and I appreciate uh, Pastor Mike so much. Uh, we've gotten to know each other over the years, and it's been many, many years. Pastor Mike, come on up. And, uh, and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to listen as he brings the word to us this morning. Y- yeah, okay. <laughs> Bibles are... I thought I was going to be the special member earlier. But yeah, well, you, know. you could become a member of Westgate, but you know, but you are special, Mike, you That's are. Right. Appreciate that. Let me just yeah. pray. Father, may you anoint Mike with your Holy Spirit at this time. Guide and direct him in the words that he says, Lord. May those words touch our hearts. Use your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us into a deeper walk with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. They always put the order of service right in front of the preacher so he knows how much time he doesn't have to preach a message on. But, Well, good morning, Westgate Alliance Church. Glad to be here today. Uh, I'm Mike Newson, as he said. My wife, Bonnie, is with me. Uh, we've been pastoring Lawson since uh, 2002. Uh, my daughter, Amy, and her husband, uh, Andrew, are there. Uh, they've come to join us in the celebration of uh, Theo's dedication today. Um, but being in this city for so long gives me a bit of a benefit and puts me in a bit of a unique position to get to know a lot of churches, gets to know a lot of you, and it also gets me the opportunity to get to know a lot of pastors. And uh, I've been a proud friend of Pastor uh, Uh, Frank and Pearl Jeske uh, for a long time now, as he said. I have literally been around the world uh, with them uh, in our trip to Israel together. Uh, I would go to the wall for that man. He is a great friend. He is a great pastor. And I know that he's a great pastor because he has pastored me in many of the same ways that he has pastored you. Uh, So I commend him to you. He's a great guy. And you've got a great pastoral team. I'm a little biased, obviously, because uh, uh, Jared is my, my son. And uh, Danica, my daughter-in-law, and my uh, grandson, Theo, obviously I'm a little biased in, in their part, but also for Pastor Jeff and Karen, as uh, we've gotten to know each other a little bit at district events, but I hope to get, them know, get to know them a little bit better in future days. Well, one little story as I begin, a family story, otherwise known as a sermon illustration to us pastors. But uh, one night, uh, Danica woke up to find Jared wasn't in bed. Uh, Looking at the clock, it was like 2.30 in the morning, he's not there. So she throws off the blankets and she walks into where she thinks he might be in Theo's room. And that's where she finds him. He's standing over Theo's crib. She leans against the doorframe and she just keeps silent and she watches him. She watches and on his face is a mixture of emotions like wonder and disbelief and doubt, but delight and amazement. At one point, Jared kind of just rubs his brow and he shakes his head and he whispers, amazing. And then he smiles from ear to ear. Seeing that, Danica moves towards him, slips her arms around him and whispers in his ear, a penny for your thoughts? He said, amazing, isn't it? When you really take the time to think about it, we got a smoking good deal on this crib, didn't we? Sometimes, friends, we can all be in the same church, we can all be breathing the same air, we can be singing the same songs, reading the same Bible, and yet have different expectations about what our belief in Jesus and the church is supposed to be all about. Do you know what the most common concern is that I hear from people both in the pew and also in the pulpit? The most common concern is, where is the power of the gospel today? It comes from preachers who desperately want to see their church and their community impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It comes from the believers who who wonder why God seems so distant in their life and unapproachable, maybe even a little uncaring. It comes from their small group leaders who try to help a member overcome a nagging sin issue. It comes from the mom and dad who pray day and night for their kid who has been swayed by the enemy and has moved into some destructive patterns of behavior. 
It comes from a church full of people who go from one day after another without the miracles that they keep asking God for. And you know what? It even comes from the unbelievers in your life who will challenge you saying, why doesn't your God ever show up? You know, when Jesus arrived on the scene, we see him traveling throughout Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God. And when he walked down the streets, the main streets of the towns and the villages and the cities in Jerusalem and Israel, the power of God accompanied his message, didn't it? And stuff happened. People got healed, delivered, and saved. And people started recognizing from all those wonders that he was performing that he was the Christ, God's anointed one, the Messiah. And so as he traveled... He collected all kinds of people to himself, people who wanted to enter into his kingdom and be a part of his gospel. And they joined him on his mission. He even gave them authority, the Bible tells us, to do the works that he did. But he made made one point very clear. I'm going to get you to turn in your Bibles to John 14 verses 10 to 14. I always include the text on the overhead just in case people forget their Bibles, but if you have a Bible, please use it. If uh, you have a phone, you can use it there as well. But let me read it to you. John 14, verses 10 to 14. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, Jesus said. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. It had been Jesus' plan ever since he started his mission at that Jordan River with John. This was the purpose for which the Father sent the Son, to make disciples who could reproduce more disciples in every nation on the planet until the whole world heard the gospel of the kingdom of heaven and the plan of God's salvation and salvation in his name. And he commissions every follower to follow him into that plan. That's the plan, right? Uh, My church would be responding back, right, pastor? There you go. But that's not the plan that maybe you heard when you first heard about God's plan of salvation. Forty years ago, when I accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, I didn't come from a believing family. I had never been to church. I had never been to Sunday school, never went to a Christian camp or a VBS or anything. I didn't have any Christian experience, any Christians in my extended family, I didn't have any Christians in my block that I knew of, and I didn't have any Christians at my school until I was 17 years of age. And as a result, I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing now as a Christian when I finally accepted Christ. And so I asked my best friend, the one who led me to Christ, and I said, now that I'm a Christian, what's the plan? What do I do now? And he said, well, gee, I don't know. He said, I guess just keep believing in Jesus, just keep going to church, just keep reading your Bible and praying, and just keep your nose clean. That was it. Well, those things aren't even close to Jesus' plan, are they? In fact, according to Jesus, that's an incomplete gospel. But it's a gospel that many in the West have believed. And I'll, and, and I'll be up front with you, that's why both people in the pew and people in the pulpit Keep asking, keep wondering, where's the power of the gospel today? And because we don't know the answer to that, it makes the next things that Jesus says even more difficult for us to believe. Look at verses 13 to 14. Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. You know, What makes that even harder for us to believe is that Jesus repeats himself twice. He makes the same promise twice. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Two times he says it. Now, just about everybody reads that as, they read it in a a way to say, well, maybe I have to qualify what Jesus said. 
And then they begin to heap all kinds of conditions on it in words that, that maybe they don't even understand. Things that maybe need to be answered before that comes true. Or they make excuses for why Jesus really didn't mean that for today, maybe back then with his disciples, but not for us today. <gasps> Listen to John 14. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Interestingly, all of chapter 14 and chapter 16 for that matter is all about what will happen when Jesus returns to the Father. Jesus is telling us what he told us at his baptism. That the reason that he's returning to the Father is to send the Holy Spirit. And you will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. That's what the, the Holy Spirit will make possible. So when Jesus went to the Father, the Spirit came. He enabled us who believe to do even greater things. Greater things. And it wasn't long ago when Pastor Frank took you through, was working you through Acts chapter 2, I'm sure, and he explained everything that happened at Pentecost as the Holy Spirit came to indwell believers and the implications of that upon the church today. The minute you and I declared Jesus as Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit came to reside within us, the Bible tells us, right? Amen? And when he does, apparently he doesn't come alone. Somehow, he divinely, supernaturally, as only God can, unites us to and infuses us with the entire triune God. Listen to John 14. We'll go a little bit later. Uh, verse 17 to 21. Jesus said, And you will know him, that is, Holy Spirit, for he lives with you and will be, what? In you. I will not leave you as orphans who will come to you. I will come to you. So Holy Spirit and Jesus will come. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the fa my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Verse 23, my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. We will, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And because of this indwelling presence of the triune God, Scripture says that you gain a number of new things. You gained a new nature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You are now a new creation in Christ. Praise the Lord, eh? You also gained a new relationship to God. Scriptures like Ephesians 1, verse 3 says that you are no longer an object of God's wrath, but an object of God's what? Mercy. You gained a, the resurrection life of Jesus. Scriptures like Ephesians 1, verse 5 says that before you and I were dead in our trespasses to our sins but now we are alive in Christ. Hallelujah. You also gained a new position in the world and in heaven. It says in scriptures like Ephesians 1 verse 6, it says that God raised us up with Christ. He raised us up with Christ to be with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You also gained a new work. Scriptures like Ephesians 1 verse 10 says that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We've gained so much, haven't we? Hallelujah. And what did Jesus ask you to do to gain all of that? Nothing. Right? Nothing at all. All you had to do was ask for it and it was yours. And he gave it freely without condition or cost to you. Great cost to him, but no cost to you. So let's now interpret Jesus' words in John 14 with that in mind. Verse 12. As you are doing the works I have been doing, verse 13, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 14. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is what we know from this passage. Asking is both what I call transactional and transpositional. I kind of made up that last one. It's transactional and it's transpositional. Let me walk you through both of those. Asking prayer is transactional, number one. It's transactional in that Jesus said, ask me, ask me for anything in my name, and I will give it to you. 
Can it be that simple, though? Well, when you became a Christian, another transaction took place, didn't it? You simply asked Jesus, and Jesus gave you eternal life, right? It was that simple. It sounded too good to be true then, didn't it? But it was true, wasn't it? Because God is rich and mercy. You didn't have to meet any certain conditions, perform any certain rituals. You didn't have to prove yourself in any way. You didn't even have to beg God for it. He just gave it to you. He simply heard your ask for eternal life, and he gave it to you. He gave you what you asked for. In fact, he gave you way more than you were even asking for, right? So, what do you think Jesus meant when he said, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it? Asking is first of all transactional, just ask. But you know what? Many Christians kind of never get to learn anything more about prayer than just asking. Let's move on to the second one. Asking prayer is also transpositional. It's transpositional in that Jesus said in John 14, 17 to 20, by your new position in me, by being in Christ, and by the Holy Spirit, I will do it. So to transpose means to change something from one position to another position, to exchange the positions of two things. And when you believed, when you first made that transaction, when that transaction first occurred, the minute you asked Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, there was a change of positions that took place at the very center of your being. You stepped off the throne of your life, and God, by the Holy Spirit, stepped onto the throne of your life, right? Did that happen? Yeah? But more than that, the triune God came to dwell you personally, John 14, 17 to 20. And now, because of that new exchange of positions in your life, he infuses you with the life and victory and the authority of Christ. See, you didn't just become a Christian, you didn't just become a Christian when you said yes to Jesus. Positionally, you became his child. You became a son or daughter in God. You became part of his family. And that makes you God's family representative. It means, it's his, it's his means of enacting his kingdom purposes everywhere in the world to act through his family. You became his hands. He became the hands and the feet, and the mouth and the heart of Jesus to the world. John 14, verse 12. I tell you the truth. Whoever, you should probably underline that, highlight it, circle it, whatever, I tell you the truth, whoever believes in me, who does whoever include, just the disciples? No, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. They will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. That means, friends, that because he went to the Father, whatever we do, whatever we pray in his name, we do and pray on his behalf by his power and by his authority, right? It just follows. The whole transpositional aspect of prayer is summed up in Jesus' words in verse 19 to 20. He says, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you will realize, light bulb moment, you will realize that I am in the, my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And I think I see all kinds of light bulbs kind of going off here today and sometimes. Moments where you're saying, what this means now is that with Christ in me, I am called to do the works of Jesus. You are called to proclaim the lordship of Jesus wherever you go. When we reproduce disciples in all nations or in our church, we are reproducing his lordship everywhere until the whole world bends the knee to Jesus, right? When we pray for people and ask for miracles, we are praying for the Lordship of Jesus to overcome their burdens and their demons. And we do all this in him and by him. And that's when we won't have to bemoan the fact anymore that there is no power in the gospel that we say we believe in. Because it will be happening. We will see Jesus at work around us. Because he's alive, right? You just went through Easter. Come on, he's alive, right? 
Amen. He's alive. And because the gospel we now will be living, others will see us infused by the Spirit of God with power. So much so that the preacher who desperately wants the gospel to transform his church and his community will see it. The believer who once wondered why God seems so distant and uncaring over their troubles will now be emboldened with the power of God. The small group leader who tries to help a friend in his group overcome a nagging sin issue will see deliverance and victory for that friend. The mom and the dad who pray day and night for their kids not to be swayed by the enemy will see their kid declare Jesus as Lord and get filled with the same Holy Spirit they are and finally do the works of Jesus himself. The pews and the lobbies of this church will see followers of Jesus with hands on shoulders after the service, before the service, praying for one another. When a need is asked in faith, they pray for one another in power. And they see miracles of God take place. By the way, you don't need your pastor for that. John 14 tells us that everyone who believes can do these works. And when we finally get to the place, when Westgate Alliance Church finally gets that to that place it will begin to carry all of that work out into the streets into their workplaces into their schools into the cafes and grocery store lines lineups in their neighborhoods even that that unbeliever who is a strong atheist and would challenge you every day about your faith will see the people of God doing the works of Jesus and they will not be able to deny the kingdom of God has showed up That day can be today, friends. It can be today for Westgate if you believe in Jesus and believe what he said. So what do we say about unanswered prayer then? Well, here's our third point. Why are our prayers unanswered? The transactional part of asking, I think we get. We ask and Jesus answered. But here's the thing. The transaction can never be separate from the indwelling relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? Christianity is fundamentally a relational faith. We can't remove the relationship piece from our faith and retain the same essence of Christianity that Jesus meant it to have. In Jesus' name assumes a backstory in your life. It assumes a relationship with Christ. Yet many Christians treat Jesus like a genie. If they need anything from him, that's when they call out his name and they maybe rub their Bibles and say, show up, Jesus, do your stuff. That's when we seek him. But if that's the only time we seek him, aren't we only seeking him for his gifts? You are only able to pray at all. You are only able to be heard at all because of how you are now related to God in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Look at how the relationship that Jesus had with his father is all over chapter 14 and 60. It's the basis of everything he did on earth, isn't it? How did Jesus teach the disciples to pray? He said, our father. He included them in that family. And because of our faith in Jesus, positionally and relationally, we are his kids too. You are a child of God if you profess faith in Christ. Amen? And when he made reproducing disciples, he said in John 15, 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. When he worked miracles, Jesus declared, John 5, 19 to 20, very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. There's the dependency on the relationship, right, with the Father. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all he does, all, excuse me, all his works. Please remember this. There is no transaction without relationship. So if you're not confident in the relationship that you have with God, if you're not confident that God hears you when you pray, then you need to spend more time in your relationship before you get asking. Because if you're not confident in the relationship that you have with God, then you're going to get delusioned with prayer. And that's why I see so many people 
Their knowledge of God is shaped by how God performs for them. Not but what they know about God. They think because God hasn't answered their prayer that he either doesn't care about them or maybe, maybe he doesn't have the kind of power he says he does. Friends, know, know your God. Know the triune God. Number four, answered prayer is joined to doing Jesus' work. Should be a natural follow-through now, right? Answered prayer is joined to doing Jesus' work. Verse 10. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Let me review to you the works that Jesus did. Work number one. From his baptism at the Jordan and on, Jesus remained dependent on the Holy Spirit. And then he continued traveling throughout the land. Work two. Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom of God everywhere he went. Verse, work number three, Jesus made reproducing disciples, disciples who could make more disciples generation after generation until all nations are reached with the gospel of God. Work number four, Jesus operated in the positional authority of the Father, healing the sick, casting out demons, and occasionally raising the dead. He remained dependent on his Father for all those things. I can do nothing except what I see my Father doing. And these are the works Jesus said those who believe in him will do also. Wrap your head around that thought. Now that's a far cry from the works that my friend told me to do when I first believed. When I asked him, now that I'm a Christian, what's the plan now for me? What do I do next? And he said, I, I, you know, I don't know. Just keep believing in Jesus. Keep going to church. Keep reading your Bible and praying. And keep your nose clean. That's not the works of Jesus, is it? And that's not what the kingdom of God on earth looks like when Jesus taught us to pray. There's nothing supernatural about that kind of living. Nothing that's going to impress people in your life network to say, wow, look at the power of God. So is it any wonder that our prayers aren't answered? Can you see places in your life network? Take a moment to think about that. Can you see places and people in your life network to whom the kingdom of God has still yet to come? Of course you do. You know people in your family, your friends, your work, your church, your world who do not know Jesus or who need Jesus to show up because they've got some burden in their life that's far greater than they can rebuild on their own. Of course you know people. But let me let you in on something. There is only one roadblock to them believing in Jesus. You've got to give them a reason to believe. They don't need someone, they need someone, sorry, who's going to be living the kingdom of God and doing the works that Jesus did. Friends, they need to see you doing the works of Jesus. This is your life network. God has specially designed your life network so that you can impact it for the kingdom of God. So we need to show up. Jesus remained dependent on the Holy Spirit. You can do that. Jesus, is, Jesus said you could, didn't he? Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God everywhere he went. You can do that. He said you could. Jesus made reproducing disciples. You can do that too. He said you could. Jesus operated in the positional authority of the Father all the time, healing the sick, casting out demons, and occasionally even raising the dead. You can do that. He said, everyone who believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Look at verse 13. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. As a Christian, you carry in yourself the authority to proclaim the kingdom of God and the lordship of Jesus everywhere you go. You carry the authority to bring the miraculous power of Jesus into the room when you walk in. You're not alone. He is with you. He is in you. And it's his power, but he grants you license as a son of God, as a daughter of God, to identify what's needed in your life network to bring the lordship of Jesus and the kingdom of God to bear on that place, on that person at that time. And cooperating with him and operating in him 
by his power, you may ask for anything with authority, with confidence that his kingdom power will be released in, your, in his name by his authority. And as you intentionally move out throughout your life network to do the works of Jesus, you will see more of the miraculous take place. But that's not the reason we do it. The reason we do it is to establish the lordship of Jesus and his kingdom in every sphere of our life network. And so I want you to think about your life network right now. Think about the people there. Where does the kingdom of God need to come most obviously right now? Among your family, among your friends, at work, maybe even right here at church, or in the life connections that you make every day in the world. Think of the people. Think of one person that you know needs Jesus or needs the kingdom of God to come and impact their world right now with his power. Think about that person. You got that person in mind? When they tell you, when you see that person in your mind, whether it's in the lobby here at this church or at school, at work, when you're in your neighborhood, whether you're standing in line at Starbucks or at the line at the grocery store, when they tell you that there is something in their life that is broken, friends, that's your cue from the Holy Spirit that you can move in and that this is going to be a kingdom moment right now. It's time for you to do the work of Jesus. When you hear a burden, when you hear a pain, when you hear a trouble, that's your cue from the Holy Spirit to move in and do the work of Jesus. To not be shy about it because the Holy Spirit's leading you at that time. And this is my cue to you. Develop then a pray pray now mindset. Develop a pray now mindset. As the worship team comes up and gets prepared, I want to explain a little bit about what this looks like for us. When someone shares their pain, or their brokenness with you. That's when you need to engage in pray now. Don't pray later. Don't say, I'll pray about that when I get home. Pray right now. Tell them, you know what? I know Jesus, and you do. I know Jesus, and I know that he doesn't want to see you in this kind of pain and brokenness in your life. And I'm going to pray for you right now, okay? And you just pray. You declare Jesus as Lord over their burden. Father, I thank you that you hear me. You know he hears you. He says he does. Father, I thank you that you hear me, and by your authority, I declare Jesus Lord over my friend's burden. Command it to be healed, and it will be healed. Amen. Remember, wherever you go and with whomever you're with, you are Christ's family. And you are his family representative in that sphere, in that space of your life network. So just act like it. Pray like it. Speak like it. That's called faith. Pray now is faith in action. And God honors faith, doesn't he? Amen? That's called faith. When you step out and boldly declare Jesus is Lord over the world around you. Because he is Lord. Hallelujah. Amen? He is Lord. Your world just doesn't know it yet because they haven't seen Christians demonstrate it. They need to see you demonstrate it every day. They can if they see you and if they see this church in this community doing the works of Jesus by the authority of the Father. And it begins within this household of faith. When people share a need, a burden with you, you just say, let's pray now. Not, I'll take you to my pastor so he can pray with you. No, you are a child of God. You can pray. You believe. Pray now, right? Will you do that? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we anticipate the promise of Jesus' words when he says in John 14, 13, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son that we may ask you for anything in his name and you will do it. You didn't say I might. You didn't say if I feel like it. Lord, when all these things line up and we exercise faith in Christ, we anticipate that you will not only embolden us to pray now, but that, Lord, you would go ahead of us, that you would do the work through us that needs to be done. Lord, all of us, were thinking of some people in our life network that need the lordship of Jesus, that need the kingdom of God to come to bear on their situation right now. 
And so in Jesus' name, I ask you, Father, to set up those divine appointments right now so that when they go home today or when they enter workspace or school space tomorrow, that, Lord, you would give them opportunity and they would take the opportunity, the initiative, when they hear this has happened in my life or this is my burden, that they say, let's pray now. Lord, give us the authority. Lord, you've given us the authority. Now we just need to act on it in faith. And God's people said, amen. God bless you, friends. I hope to see some hands on shoulders after the service. God bless.